Volume 1 Chapter 6 When we arrived at Windsor, I found that Raymond and Perdita had departed for the continent. I took possession of my sister's cottage, and blessed myself that I lived within view of Windsor Castle. It was a curious fact, that at this period, when by the marriage of Perdita I was allied to one of the richest individuals in England, and was bound by the most intimate friendship to its chiefest noble, I experienced the greatest excess of poverty that I had ever known. My knowledge of the worldly principles of Lord Raymond would have ever prevented me from applying to him, however deep my distress might have been. It was in vain that I repeated to myself with regard to Adrian that his purse was open to me, that one in soul, as we were, our fortunes ought also to be common. I could never, while with him, think of his bounty as a remedy to my poverty, and I even put aside hastily his offers of supplies, assuring him of a falsehood that I needed them not. How could I say to this generous being, maintain me in idleness? You who have dedicated your powers of mind and fortune to the benefit of your species, shall you so misdirect your exertions as to support in uselessness the strong, healthy, and capable? And yet I dared not request him to use his influence that I might obtain an honorable provision for myself, for then I should have been obliged to leave Windsor. I hovered forever around the walls of its castle, beneath its enshadowing thickets. My sole companions were my books and my loving thoughts. I studied the wisdom of the ancients and gazed on the happy walls that sheltered the beloved of my soul. My mind was nevertheless idle. I pored over the poetry of old times. I studied the metaphysics of Plato and Berkeley. I read the histories of Greece and Rome and of England's former periods, and I watched the movements of the lady of my heart. At night I could see her shadow on the walls of her apartment. By day I viewed her in her flower garden, or riding in the park with her usual companions. Methought the charm would be broken if I were seen, but I heard the music of her voice and was happy. I gave to each heroine of whom I read, her beauty and matchless excellences. Such was Antigone, when she guided the blind Oedipus to the grove of the Eumenides, and discharged the funeral rites of Polynices. Such was Miranda in the unvisited cave of Prospero, such Haiti on the sands of the Ionian island. I was mad with excess of passionate devotion, but pride, tameless as fire, invested my nature and prevented me from betraying myself by word or look. In the meantime, while I thus pampered myself with rich mental repasts, a peasant would have disdained my scanty fare, which I sometimes robbed from the squirrels of the forest. I was, I own, often tempted to recur to the lawless feats of my boyhood and knocked down the almost tame pheasants that perched upon the trees, and bent their bright eyes on me. But supped upon sentiment, and dreamt vainly of such morsels sweet, as I might not waking attain. But at this period, the whole scheme of my existence was about to change. The orphan and neglected son of Verney was on the eve of being linked to the mechanism of society by a golden chain, and to enter into all the duties and affections of life. Miracles were to be wrought in my favor, the machine of social life pushed with vast effort backward. Attend, O reader, while I narrate this tale of wonders. One day, as Adrian and Idris were riding through the forest with their mother and accustomed companions, Idris, drawing her brother aside from the rest of the cavalcade, suddenly asked him, what had become of his friend, Lionel Verney? Even from this spot, replied Adrian, pointing to my sister's cottage, you can see his dwelling. Indeed, said Idris. And why, if he be so near, does he not come to see us and make one of our society? I often visit him, replied Adrian. But you may easily guess the motives which prevent him from coming where his presence may annoy anyone among us. I do guess them, said Idris, and such as they are, I would not venture to combat them. Tell me, however, in what way he passes his time, what he is doing and thinking in his cottage retreat? Nay, my sweet sister, replied Adrian, you ask me more than I can well answer, but if you feel interest in him, why not visit him? He will feel highly honored, and thus you may repay a part of the obligation I owe him, and compensate for the injuries fortune has done him. I will most readily accompany you to his abode, said the lady, not that I wish that either of us should unburden ourselves of our debt, which, being no less than your life, must remain unpayable ever. But let us go, tomorrow we will arrange to ride out together, and proceeding toward that part of the forest, call upon him. The next evening, therefore, though the autumnal change had brought on cold and rain, Adrian and Idris entered my cottage. They found me curious-like, feasting on sorry fruits for supper but they brought gifts richer than the golden bribes of the Sabines. 
nor could I refuse the invaluable store of friendship and delight which they bestowed. Surely the glorious twins of Latona were not more welcome when, in the infancy of the world, they were brought forth to beautify and enlighten this sterile promontory, than were this angelic pair to my lowly dwelling and grateful heart. We sat like one family round my hearth. Our talk was on subjects unconnected with the emotions that evidently occupied each, but we each divined the other's thought. And as our voices spoke of indifferent matters, our eyes, in mute language, told a thousand things no tongue could have uttered. They left me in an hour's time. They left me happy, how unspeakably happy. It did not require the measured sounds of human language to syllable the story of my ecstasy. Idris had visited me. Idris I should again and again see. My imagination did not wander beyond the completeness of this knowledge. I trod air, no doubt, no fear, no hope even disturbed me. I clasped with my soul the fullness of contentment, satisfied, undesiring, beatified. For many days, Adrian and Idris continued to visit me thus. In this dear intercourse, love in the guise of enthusiastic friendship infused more and more of his omnipotent spirit. Idris felt it. Yes, divinity of the world, I read your characters in her looks and gesture. I heard your melodious voice echoed by her. You prepared for us a soft and flowery path, all gentle thoughts adorned it. Your name, O oh love, was not spoken, but you stood the genius of the hour veiled, and time, but no mortal hand, might raise the curtain. Organs of articulate sound did not proclaim the union of our hearts, for untoward circumstance allowed no opportunity for the expression that hovered on our lips. O oh my pen, haste thou to write what was, before the thought of what is arrests the hand that guides thee. If I lift up my eyes and see the desert earth, and feel that those dear eyes have spent their mortal luster, and that those beauteous lips are silent, their crimson leaves faded, forever I am mute. But you live, my Idris, even now you move before me, there was a glade, O oh reader, a grassy opening in the wood. The retiring trees left its velvet expanse as a temple for love, the silver Thames bounded it on one side, and a willow bending down dipped in the water, its naiad hair, disheveled by the wind's viewless hand. The oaks around were the home of a tribe of nightingales. There am I now, Idris, in youth's dear prime, is by my side. Remember, I am just twenty-two, and seventeen summers have scarcely passed over the beloved of my heart. The river swollen by autumnal rains deluged the lowlands, and Adrian in his favorite boat is employed in the dangerous pastime of plucking the topmost bough from a submerged oak. Are you weary of life, O Adrian, that you thus play with danger? He has obtained his prize, and he pilots his boat through the flood. Our eyes were fixed on him fearfully, but the stream carried him away from us. He was forced to land far lower down, and to make a considerable circuit before he could join us. He is safe, said Idris, as he leapt on shore, and waved the bow over his head in token of success. We will wait for him here. We were alone together. The sun had set. The song of the nightingales began. The evening star shone distinct in the flood of light, which was yet unfaded in the west. The blue eyes of my angelic girl were fixed on this sweet emblem of herself. How the light palpitates, she said, which is that star's life. Its vacillating effulgence seems to say that its state, even like ours upon earth, is wavering and inconstant. It fears, methinks, and it loves. Gaze not on the star, dear generous friend. I cried, read not love in its trembling rays, look not upon distant worlds, speak not of the mere imagination of a sentiment. I have long been silent. Long even to sickness have I desired to speak to you, and submit my soul, my life, my entire being to you. Look not on the star, dear love, or do, and let that eternal spark plead for me, let it be my witness and my advocate, silent as it shines. Love is to me as light to the star. Even so long as that is uneclipsed by annihilation, so long shall I love you. Veiled forever to the world's callous eye must be the transport of that moment. Still do I feel her graceful form press against my full-fraught heart. Still does sight and pulse and breath sicken and fail at the remembrance of that first kiss. Slowly and silently we went to meet Adrian, whom we heard approaching. I entreated Adrian to return to me after he had conducted his sister home. And that same evening, walking among the moonlit forest paths, I poured forth my whole heart, its transport and its hope to my friend. For a moment he looked disturbed. I might have foreseen this, he said. What strife will now ensue? Pardon me, Lionel, nor wonder that the expectation of contest with my mother should jar me, when else I should delightedly confess that my best hopes are fulfilled in confiding my sister to your protection. If you do not already know it, you will soon learn the deep hate my mother bears to the name Verney. I will converse with Idris, then all that a friend can do, I will do. To her it must belong to play the lover's part, if she be capable of it. 
While the brother and sister were still hesitating in what manner they could best attempt to bring their mother over to their party, she, suspecting our meetings, taxed her children with them, taxed her fair daughter with deceit, and an unbecoming attachment for one whose only merit was being the son of the profligate favorite of her imprudent father, and who was doubtless as worthless as he from whom he boasted his descent. The eyes of Idris flashed at this accusation. She replied, I do not deny that I love Verney. Prove to me that he is worthless, and I will never see him more. Dear madam, said Adrian, let me entreat you to see him to cultivate his friendship. You will wonder then, as I do, at the extent of his accomplishments and the brilliancy of his talents. Pardon me, gentle reader, this is not futile vanity, not futile, since to know that Adrian felt thus brings joy even now to my lone heart. Mad and foolish boy, exclaimed the angry lady. You have chosen with dreams and theories to overthrow my schemes for your own aggrandizement, but you shall not do the same by those I have formed for your sister. I bet too well understand the fascination you both labor under. Since I had the same struggle with your father, to make him cast off the parent of this youth, who hid his evil propensities with the smoothness and subtlety of a viper. In those days how often did I hear of his attractions, his widespread conquests, his wit, his refined manners. It is well when flies only are caught by such spiders' webs, but is it for the high-born and powerful to bow their necks to the flimsy yoke of these unmeaning pretensions? Were your sister indeed the insignificant person she deserves to be, I would willingly leave her to the fate, the wretched fate, of the wife of a man, whose very person, resembling as it does his wretched father, ought to remind you of the folly and vice it typifies. But remember, Lady Idris, it is not alone the once royal blood of England that colors your veins, you are a princess of Austria, and every life drop is akin to emperors and kings. Are you then a fit mate for an uneducated shepherd boy, whose only inheritance is his father's tarnished name? I can make but one defense, replied Idris. The same offered by my brother. See Lionel, converse with my shepherd boy. The countess interrupted her indignantly. Yours, she cried, and then, smoothing her impassioned features to a disdainful smile, she continued, We will talk of this another time. All I now ask, all your mother, Idris, requests is that you will not see this upstart during the interval of one month. I dare not comply, said Idris. It would pain him too much. I have no right to play with his feelings to accept his proffered love and then sting him with neglect. This is going too far, her mother answered, with quivering lips and eyes again instinct by anger. Nay, madam, said Adrian, unless my sister consent never to see him again, it is surely an useless torment to separate them for a month. Certainly, replied the ex-queen with bitter scorn, his love and her love and both their childish flutterings are to be put in fit comparison with my years of hope and anxiety, with the duties of the offspring of kings, with the high and dignified conduct which one of her descent ought to pursue. But it is unworthy of me to argue and complain. Perhaps you will have the goodness to promise me not to marry during that interval. This was asked only half ironically, and Idris wondered why her mother should extort from her a solemn vow not to do what she had never dreamed of doing, but the promise was required and given. All went on cheerfully now. We met as usual, and talked without dread of our future plans. The countess was so gentle, and even beyond her wont, amiable with her children, that they began to entertain hopes of her ultimate consent. She was too unlike them, too utterly alien to their tastes, for them to find delight in her society or in the prospect of its continuance, but it gave them pleasure to see her conciliating and kind. Once even, Adrian ventured to propose her receiving me. She refused with a smile, reminding him that for the present his sister had promised to be patient. One day, after the lapse of nearly a month, Adrian received a letter from a friend in London, requesting his immediate presence for the furtherance of some important object. Guileless himself, Adrian feared no deceit. I rode with him as far as Staines. He was in high spirits, and since I could not see Idris during his absence, he promised a speedy return. His gaiety, which was extreme, had the strange effect of awakening in me contrary feelings, a presentiment of evil hung over me, I loitered on my return. I counted the hours that must elapse before I saw Idris again, wherefore should this be, what evil might not happen in the meantime? Might not her mother take advantage of Adrian's absence to urge her beyond her sufferance, perhaps to entrap her, I resolved, let what would befall, to see and converse with her the following day. This determination soothed me. Tomorrow, loveliest and best hope and joy of my life, tomorrow I will see thee, fool, to dream of a moment's delay, I went to rest. 
At past midnight, I was awaked by a violent knocking. It was now deep winter. It had snowed and was still snowing. The wind whistled in the leafless trees, despoiling them of the white flakes as they fell. Its drear moaning and the continued knocking mingled wildly with my dreams. At length, I was wide awake. Hastily dressing myself, I hurried to discover the cause of this disturbance and to open my door to the unexpected visitor. Pale as the snow that showered about her, with clasped hands, Idris stood before me. Save me, she exclaimed, and would have sunk to the ground had I not supported her. In a moment, however, she revived, and with energy, almost with violence, entreated me to saddle horses, to take her away, away to London, to her brother, at least to save her. I had no horses, she wrung her hands. What can I do, she cried. I am lost, we are both forever lost, but come. Come with me, Lionel, here I must not stay, we can get a chaise at the nearest post house, yet perhaps we have time. Come, oh come with me to save and protect me. When I heard her piteous demands, while with disordered dress, disheveled hair, and aghast looks, she wrung her hands. The idea shot across me, as she also mad? Sweet one, and I folded her to my heart, better repose than wander further, rest, my beloved, I will make a fire, you are chill. Rest, she cried, repose, you rave Lionel, if you delay we are lost, come I pray you, unless you would cast me off forever. That Idris, the princely born nursling of wealth and luxury, should have come through the tempestuous winter night from her regal abode, and standing at my lowly door, conjure me to fly with her through darkness and storm, was surely a dream, again her plaintive tones, the sight of her loveliness, assured me that it was no vision. Looking timidly around, as if she feared to be overheard, she whispered, I have discovered, tomorrow, that is today, already the tomorrow is come, before dawn, foreigners, Austrians, my mother's hirelings, are to carry me off to Germany, to prison, to marriage, to anything except you and my brother, take me away, or soon they will be here, I was frightened by her vehemence, and imagined some mistake in her incoherent tale, but I no longer hesitated to obey her. She had come by herself from the castle, three long miles at midnight through the heavy snow. We must reach Englefield Green, a mile and a half further, before we could obtain a chaise. She told me that she had kept up her strength and courage till her arrival at my cottage, and then both failed. Now she could hardly walk, supporting her as I did, still she lagged. And at the distance of half a mile, after many stoppages, shivering fits, and half faintings, she slipped from my supporting arm on the snow, and with a torrent of tears averred that she must be taken, for that she could not proceed. I lifted her up in my arms, her light form rested on my breast. I felt no burden except the internal one of contrary and contending emotions. Brimming delight now invested me. Again her chill limbs touched me as a torpedo, and I shuddered in sympathy with her pain and fright. Her head lay on my shoulder, her breath waved my hair, her heart beat near mine, transport made me tremble, blinded me, annihilated me, till a suppressed groan, bursting from her lips, the chattering of her teeth, which she strove vainly to subdue, and all the signs of suffering she evinced, recalled me to the necessity of speed and succor. At last I said to her, there is Englefield Green, there the inn. But if you are seen thus strangely circumstanced, dear Idris, even now your enemies may learn your flight too soon. Were it not better that I hired the chaise alone, I will put you in safety meanwhile and return to you immediately. She answered that I was right and might do with her as I pleased. I observed the door of a small outhouse ajar. I pushed it open, and with some hay strewed about, I formed a couch for her, placing her exhausted frame on it and covering her with my cloak. I feared to leave her, she looked so wan and faint. But in a moment she reacquired animation and with that fear, and again she implored me not to delay to call up the people of the inn and obtain a conveyance and horses, even though I harnessed them myself, was the work of many minutes, minutes, each freighted with the weight of ages. I caused the chaise to advance a little, waited till the people of the inn had retired, and then made the postboy draw up the carriage to the spot where Idris, impatient, and now somewhat recovered, stood waiting for me. I lifted her into the chaise. I assured her that with our four horses we should arrive in London before five o'clock the hour when she would be sought and missed. I besought her to calm herself, a kindly shower of tears relieved her, and by degrees she related her tale of fear and peril. That same night after Adrian's departure, her mother had warmly expostulated with her on the subject of her attachment to me. Every motive, every threat, every angry taunt was urged in vain. She seemed to consider that through me she had lost Raymond. I was the evil influence of her life. 
I was even accused of increasing and confirming the mad and base apostasy of Adrian from all views of advancement and grandeur, and now this miserable mountaineer was to steal her daughter. Never Idris related did the angry lady deign to recur to gentleness and persuasion. If she had, the task of resistance would have been exquisitely painful. As it was, the sweet girl's generous nature was roused to defend and ally herself with my despised cause. Her mother ended with a look of contempt and covert triumph, which for a moment awakened the suspicions of Idris. When they parted for the night, the countess said, Tomorrow I trust your tone will be changed, be composed, I have agitated you, go to rest, and I will send you a medicine I always take when unduly restless, it will give you a quiet night. By the time that she had with uneasy thoughts laid her fair cheek upon her pillow, her mother's servant brought a draft. A suspicion again crossed her at this novel proceeding, sufficiently alarming to determine her not to take the potion, but dislike of contention, and a wish to discover whether there was any just foundation for her conjectures, made her, she said almost instinctively, and in contradiction to her usual frankness, pretend to swallow the medicine. Then, agitated as she had been by her mother's violence, and now by unaccustomed fears, she lay unable to sleep, starting at every sound. Soon her door opened softly and on her springing up she heard a whisper, not asleep yet, and the door again closed. With a beating heart she expected another visit, and when after an interval her chamber was again invaded, having first assured herself that the intruders were her mother and an attendant, she composed herself to feign sleep. A step approached her bed, she dared not move, she strove to calm her palpitations which became more violent, when she heard her mother say mutteringly, pretty simpleton, little do you think that your game is already at an end forever. For a moment the poor girl fancied that her mother believed that she had drank poison. She was on the point of springing up, when the countess, already at a distance from the bed, spoke in a low voice to her companion, and again Idris listened. Hasten, said she, there is no time to lose, it is long past eleven, they will be here at five, take merely the clothes necessary for her journey and her jewel casket. The servant obeyed. Few words were spoken on either side, but those were caught at with avidity by the intended victim, she heard the name of her own maid mentioned. No, no, replied her mother, she does not go with us, Lady Idris must forget England and all belonging to it. And again she heard, she will not wake till late tomorrow, and we shall then be at sea. All is ready, at length the woman announced. The countess again came to her daughter's bedside. In Austria at least, she said, you will obey. In Austria, where obedience can be enforced and no choice left but between an honorable prison and a fitting marriage. Both then withdrew, though, as she went, the countess said, softly, all sleep. Though all have not been prepared for sleep, like her, I would not have any one suspect or she might be roused to resistance and perhaps escape. Come with me to my room. We will remain there till the hour agreed upon. They went. Idris, panic-struck, but animated and strengthened even by her excessive fear, dressed herself hurriedly, and going down a flight of back stairs, avoiding the vicinity of her mother's apartment, she contrived to escape from the castle by a low window, and came through snow, wind, and obscurity to my cottage, nor lost her courage until she arrived, and depositing her fate in my hands, gave herself up to the desperation and weariness that overwhelmed her. I comforted her as well as I might, joy and exultation were mine to possess and to save her. Yet not to excite fresh agitation in her, per non turbar quel bel viso sereno, I curbed my delight, I strove to quiet the eager dancing of my heart, I turned from her my eyes beaming with too much tenderness, and proudly to dark night, and the inclement atmosphere, murmured the expressions of my transport. We reached London, methought, all too soon, and yet I could not regret our speedy arrival, when I witnessed the ecstasy with which my beloved girl found herself in her brother's arms, safe from every evil under his unblamed protection. Adrian wrote a brief note to his mother, informing her that Idris was under his care and guardianship. Several days elapsed, and at last an answer came, dated from Cologne. It was useless, the haughty and disappointed lady wrote, for the Earl of Windsor and his sister to address again the injured parent whose only expectation of tranquility must be derived from oblivion of their existence. Her desires had been blasted, her schemes overthrown, she did not complain. In her brother's court she would find not compensation for their disobedience. Filial unkindness admitted of none, but such a state of things and mode of life, as might best reconcile her to her fate. Under such circumstances, she positively declined any communication with them. 
Such were the strange and incredible events that finally brought about my union with the sister of my best friend, with my adored Idris. With simplicity and courage she set aside the prejudices and opposition which were obstacles to my happiness, nor scrupled to give her hand where she had given her heart. To be worthy of her, to raise myself to her height through the exertion of talents and virtue. To repay her love with devoted, unwearied tenderness were the only thanks I could offer for the matchless gift.